November 12th, 1993 was wild. This was a night when a group of weirdos entered a steel cage with the purpose of answering one question. What was the most effective way to disable another human with your bare hands? One fighter was a 400 pound sumo wrestler, another a professional ranked boxer who fought bizarrely with a single glove. There were karate experts, pro wrestlers, street fighters, and the idea that they were all going to be allowed to just fight with no rules, no round time, and no weight limit was insane, to the point that some of the fighters themselves were convinced that this was a scripted pro wrestling style show. A delusion that came crashing down when 14 seconds into the first round, a Dutch Savat fighter's kick exploded across the face of a giant obliterating everything we thought we knew about fighting. That shock building with each captivating and brutal match that followed, but the biggest surprise of the night came when the entire tournament was won by its smallest competitor, a quiet, softly spoken man who had somehow been declared the ultimate fighting champion and yet had barely thrown a single punch or kick. And maybe you don't care about fighting. Maybe this all seems very brutal and very unnecessary. Well, you are who I'm making this video for. See, something amazing happened here tonight. And if I can do the next 20 minutes right, you'll understand not only what that is, but why it matters in recommending an obscure 2008 manga. But first, a brief word from our sponsor. Day of the Dead, They Live, Tokyo Avengers, One Piece Stampede, Laid Back Camp, Weird Resident Evil CG movies, like 50 Crayon Shinchan movies, Keep Your Hands Off, Azoken, and Puppet Master, The Littlest Reich, which may or may not be a film about Nazi puppets. These are just a fraction of the titles available on Netflix, but not the US version. See, streaming service geolocking has gotten so bad that there's now entire websites dedicated to showing you what's in different countries' Netflix libraries. And to access these forbidden titles, I like to use ExpressVPN, an app that works on any of my devices, letting me bypass geolocks by changing my online location, allowing me access to thousands of new titles quickly and easily. Personally, I'd suggest using this newfound freedom to watch Azoken over the Nazi puppet thing, but hey, that's your business, and with ExpressVPN, it can stay your business, as ExpressVPN also encrypts 100% of your network data. Go to expressvpn.com forward slash eyepatchwolf and find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN free. Okay, fighting. Yuzuko Moatari has just transferred to a Japanese high school. Having grown up in Brazil, where she spent her early years, well, getting the shit beaten out of her, but in doing so, gradually learning the arts of striking, grappling, and submission. That training manifesting in her love of mixed martial arts. A love she now wants to share with her fellow students through her newly established MMA club. Yuzuko is a delight. She's kind of like a puppy if that puppy was really into UFC and could rip out your shoulder with an armbar. And the exact kind of hero you'd expect from a shonen manga like Tepu. Only this is not our protagonist. Natsuo Oshido is a nightmare. At nearly six foot tall, she towers over the rest of her school, but not just in height. Since she was a child, she's only needed to see an action performed once or twice to be able to replicate it perfectly. Meaning, whether it's karate, basketball, or volleyball, she's an elite physical genius that effortlessly surpasses everyone around her. But that genius has isolated her from her peers and even her own family, envious and disdainful of her God-given abilities. But that's a hatred she's learned to revel in, her cold, callous nature taking joy in challenging what she sees as regular, untalented people and showing them that all their practice, all their hard work and all their training are dust in the wake of her natural, sadistic genius. In any other series, this would be our villain, but in Tepu, this is our protagonist. The story beginning when Yuzuko, unaware of who and what Natsuo is, invites her to join the Mixed Martial Arts Club, Natsuo taking this as an opportunity to humiliate the tiny fighter. But that's when she collides with something she's never encountered. 
a person she cannot dominate with raw talents. And as she stumbles away from the fight, blood dripping from her nose, she's filled with a single obsessive desire. Learn everything she can about mixed martial arts and use it to destroy Yuzuko. Tepu is the story of these two characters and the dynamic that forms between them told through fighting. And I love fighting. I've been doing martial arts most of my life to the point that I now have the combat ability of two and a half regular people or 18 small children. But I have previously stated on this channel that I'm about as violent as a small tortoise wearing a little cotton hat. And the reason both those statements can be true is to me, fighting does not equal violence. And what's so compelling about the setup of Tepu is how those two different concepts are embodied by these two characters. To me, there is nothing violent about two consenting people helping each other to get stronger through friendly competition. That is the core of what fighting in martial arts is to me and also to Yuzuko. For her, MMA is not about surpassing other people or proving your own superiority. It's about focusing on yourself and gradually getting better at something you love, even if you have zero talent in that something. Yuzuko initially having to perform even the simplest actions dozens of times before she starts to understand understand the techniques, but that lack of talent is important as it creates a space in which her personal journey of growth can happen. Victory or defeat not being the purpose of that journey, but just a byproduct of it. With that in mind, take a look at this. This is not fighting. This is two people who have lost control of their day and the random ridiculous flailing of their bodies is a result of that. The goal here isn't to better yourself or your own growth, but hurting another person with the intention of exerting your own dominance. That's violence, and that's what Natsuo embodies. Violence has become a way to hurt those who have hurt her, initially using her talent to take revenge on the bullies tormenting her brother, but eventually even turning on her own friends, like Sane, the captain of the karate club who embarrassed Natsuo's brother in a spar, only to be crushed by Natsuo in front of her entire class. However, rather than Natsuo's brother being grateful for this, he's humiliated at the thought of his little sister protecting him, and an insidious envy begins to creep into their relationship, as Natsuo's brother grows cold and abusive. And as much of a nightmare as she can be, it is kind of devastating watching her crumble in the face of her brother's hatred. Never wanting to feel the pain of that rejection again, violence has become Natsuo's way of isolating everyone around her. The only threat to that isolation being Yuzuko. Natsuo having grown so twisted that she actually envies Yuzuko's lack of talent. She sees how fulfilled the smaller fighter is and the relationships her journey have helped her build, and it maddens Natsuo. It highlights every failing of her own life, but worse, she can't even deal with the problem the only way she knows how. Violence. Yuzuko's years of training, meaning Natsuo is completely outmatched by the smaller fighter. And not only is this idea at the core of Tepu's story, but it's also what's great about martial arts. Martial arts have never been a way for the elite to get stronger, they're a way for the weak to rise up. And one of the best examples of this comes in the form of my personal favorite martial art, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And if you think this entire video is just an excuse for me to talk about how cool I think Jiu Jitsu is, only a little. Its origins go way back to the Edo era, a set of throws and grapples that samurai could fall back on if they lost their sword during combat. And it survived right up into modern times when in the 20th century, a wandering fighter named Mitsuyo Maeda traveled to Brazil on a series of challenge matches, where he befriended a Brazilian family, teaching the sons of the family the art of grappling. However, one son was excluded from the training, the sickly, frail Helio. This dude was so weak that he couldn't even run up a flight of stairs without losing his breath. But in secret, his brothers taught him what they had learned, and Helio began to develop a modified style of jujitsu, one that shaved off every excessive movement and strenuous motion, so that even the weakest person could use it to overcome larger, stronger opponents. And it did this by focusing not on traditional punches or kicks, but by dragging your opponent to the ground, then twisting and choking them into submission. And if you want to see just how effective this new Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was, 
then just look at the night of November 12th, 1993, where the first Ultimate Fighting Championship was won by the 176 pound softly spoken Hoise Gracie, who through Jiu Jitsu tapped out each of his much bigger, stronger opponents, changing the world of fighting forever. Hoise being the son of Haley Gracie. At its heart, jiu-jitsu is about overcoming things that are bigger than you. And that's why it's a fighting style that makes so much sense for a character like Yuzuko, someone with no natural advantages beyond her own desire to grow. But this also gives her fights a totally different dynamic than the brutal long-range strikes of Natsuo or the full-contact karate of Sane, in that Yuzuko has to rely on grappling, and and this introduces something really unique and special into the fights of Tepu. Despite the massive shift grappling has caused in modern martial arts, you still don't see a lot of it in anime or manga outside one or two speciality characters. And this is likely because grappling is simultaneously less visually dramatic than punches and kicks, but also much harder to decode without experience. And Tepu solves this problem beautifully. And to see how, let's first look at how Tepu creates movement in its panels. Everyone's familiar with the idea of motion lines in comics. It's a simple way to carve out a path of action and for the purposes of fighting create big moments of singular impact. But what's so cool about how Tepu does this is it rarely uses one big motion line but instead multiple smaller crescent shaped motion streaks to communicate the subtle intricate mechanics of a fight. Take this panel, the twist of a leg as it sends force shooting up the body resulting in the vicious arc of a foot cutting skyward. The split second pivot of an ankle creating a chain reaction as an entire body spins backward to avoid that initial attack. It's awesome, but when these motion streaks are applied to grappling, the panels take on a nearly instructional quality. Here we can see how Yuzuko has kicked her left leg off the ground, using that momentum to create a rotation that spirals through her hips, hands and shoulders, causing a massive centrifugal force through her entire body that she's using to snatch the arm of her much bigger, stronger opponents. And by contrast, look at how much less information we can decipher if we take away those motion streaks. The beautiful thing about this isn't just that it looks fucking awesome, but that it makes grappling make sense. When I first read Tepu, I'd spent about 10 years learning to strike, but grappling was a weird and honestly kind of scary concept to me. But it's panels like these that make me feel like, oh, I kind of get how this could work. Tepu taking the time to explain the subtle intricacies of techniques as well as specific fight scenarios. I remember first reading Tepu and seeing Natsuo get caught in a spider guard, basically a move where your opponent grabs your sleeves and jams their foot into your elbow, turning you into this weird meat puppet. It doesn't really hurt, but you have to spend massive amounts of energy just to stay upright while your opponent can just lie back and wait for their opportunity to sweep. Then, years later, one of the many, many times I got my ass kicked in jujitsu was by being caught in this exact scenario. And as my face plummeted towards the mat, all I could think was, wow, this is just like that manga I read. And I would later discover on my reread of Tepu, there was even a full on explanation of how to escape the spider guard. This kind of real life recognition happened so often during my reread of Tepu, I have to believe that Moria Ota, Tepu's author, has some real life experience with martial arts, but unfortunately, Dude's kind of a ghost online. Aside from a few details we'll get into later, the only thing I could dig up about him was a single interview, as well as this photo from a 2013 blog post where he shows up at a women's MMA event. But whatever the connection is, his drawings show a genuine understanding of what makes these techniques work and how to apply them. And that insight was a huge part of what first opened me up to grappling and eventually led to me taking up jujitsu in 2019 and that ended up becoming this super positive force in my life. When I first took up jujitsu, I was not in a good place, but fighting became this tool to help me rise out of that. I spent a lot of time thinking about why this is when non-combat sports tend to do very little for me, and the best way I can describe it is that if you play a game of tennis, the worst reasonable outcome is that you lose that game of tennis. 
but with fighting, you could get beat up or choked out or any number of painful, unpleasant things. But that kicks a part of your brain into this survival mode that shuts everything else out. You cannot worry about if you're shit at making anime videos when a large Brazilian man is trying to choke you. And yeah, it's scary, especially in the beginning, but there's also tremendous freedom that comes with existing in only that moment as your entire world becomes just you and your opponent, and all that anxiety, all the aggression that you might feel towards other people or yourself, it forces it all into perspective, lets you rise past it. And the beautiful thing about Tepu is that it captures that. It shows you the effect fighting has on the lives of each different character. For some, fighting becomes a way of pushing back against societal boundaries, the real struggle not being against any one opponent, but the perception that fighting is not a woman's activity. And as a side note, fuck that. I don't see fighting as masculine or feminine, and if you're a girl watching this and have ever wanted to try fighting for self-defense or fitness or the weird emotional stuff we just talked about, find a decent gym and just try it. The world needs more women fighters. For others like Yuzuko, we come to learn that she doesn't really experience emotion in the same way that other people do, and fighting has become her way of connecting with those around her. And I get that. There is a strange intimacy to fighting that is hard to explain if you've never experienced it. It's like when you fight someone, you experience them in a way that not even their closest friends or families do. And through that experience, you begin to get this really raw sense of who they are, their strengths, their fears, if they're willing to take risks or how they handle failure. And in that same way, those aspects of yourself are laid bare as well. And so for someone like Yuzuko, fighting becomes an answer to loneliness. The person that fighting affects most, however, is Natsuo. And this is why I think she makes such an interesting main character. Because she starts from such a flawed, broken place, we get to see the journey that fighting takes her on. And where this really becomes apparent is in one of the final fights of the entire series, where Natsuo faces her former friend, Sane. At this point in the story, Sane has hardened every part of herself, becoming the physical embodiment of all Natsuo's sins, everyone she's hurt, all the talentless people she stepped on. And what's incredible is how the opening action of this fight just seethes with the violent energy of two people who just fucking hate each other. Natsuo lashing a vicious kick at her former friend, which just finds its mark only for Sane to pivot at the last moment, sending the attack sailing past her. Sane blasting back with a counter punch only to stop her fist at the last second and obscure Natsuo's vision with an open palm drilling her with a brutal kick to the head, only for Natsuo to block Sane's attack and just smile. It is knife edge tense, but as the fight drags on, Natsuo begins to feel Sane's resentment with each devastating attack, her old friend's hatred finally sinking in, and as it does, the panels start to bleed back and forth between the brutal violence and all Natsuo's memories that have brought them both to this point. How her desire to protect her brother led to even her own mother seeing her as this violent, unstable person. And how rather than push back on that perception, she's internalized it, becoming the monster everyone has started to see her as. And with that realization, finally, all the pain, all the isolation, it hits her and it's only through recognizing this, she's able to start moving past it. Both in action and storytelling, this fight to me is one of the best I have ever read in manga, which is why it's such a shame that Tepu actually ends not long after this. Ota reportedly suffered major health issues during Tepu's publication, to the point that the series went on hiatus for two years right at the start of this fight. And while his health is obviously more important than anything, and he does conclude Tepu's main story, it does mean that some subplots are left hanging tantalizingly open, and unfortunately, he hasn't worked on anything since, aside from two Parasite side stories, which are actually awesome. <laughs> 
but it is a shame considering not only how he really felt like he was coming into his own in the latter part of Tepu, but also in the power of the story he created up to this point. When I talk about fighting as a way to free yourself from your emotional garbage, that's what I see in Natsuo at the end of this fight. She doesn't feel like that violent person anymore. And don't get me wrong, she's still kind of a nightmare, but she's also formed real connections with the people at her gym and started opening up to those around her. And as we head into the final fight of the series, there's this feeling like, wow, she really has grown. That final fight being against the person we've been building to the entire story, Yuzuko. And we're not going to talk about that fight because I want you to go read this story for yourself. So I guess that's the end of the video. Goodbye. Friends, hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did and would like to help me make more. Okay, no, no, we are going to end this video on the story of a big fight. Just not one that happened in Tepu or even in manga. This one took place in real life and brings together everything we've been talking about. Yania Jacek is the former champion and queen of the UFC strawweight division, a devastating outfighter technician who obliterates opponents with her long reach and razor sharp strikes. And tonight, she faces the champion, Zhang Weilei, an explosive monster of raw power and speed that blasts through her opponents with sheer force, backed up by a vicious submission game, and currently on a 20 match win streak. The air is thick, the atmosphere tense, both women need to win this fight. The match begins and their initial exchanges are fast and brutal. Both fighters are aiming to end this fight quickly, trading devastating shots back and forth. And for a time, it seems even, but there's a difference. Out of the two, Weilei is by far the more powerful fighter. And as this becomes apparent, Jacek struggles to stand against the overwhelming onslaught of the champion. Even her very best strikes don't seem to even phase Weilei. The second round ending as the champion drags the challenger to the ground again and again. If this continues, Jacek's third round will be her last. But she perseveres, the two continuing to trade brutal shots back and forth. Their faces swell, their thighs redden, and something starts to shift. The invincible Weilei's movements become slower, less explosive, her strikes weaker and imprecise. The power that let her dominate the early rounds has now sapped her stamina leading to a lack of aggression that lets Jacek stand back and pick apart the champion with precise, devastating strikes. Again and again, Weilei is tagged, each new blow sinking in deep and threatening to drag her into unconsciousness. And as it starts to feel like the sun is setting on Weilei's championship reign, they enter the unprecedented territory of the fourth round. In UFC, regular fights are three five minute rounds, but championship fights go for five rounds. And up to this point in her reign, no one has ever pushed Weilei to championship rounds. And so exhausted and entering unknown territory, Weilei does everything she can just to survive, absorbing knockout blow after knockout blow. I genuinely do not understand how a human can absorb this level of punishment, but somehow she does. She endures and she keeps enduring. It's like she's tapping into something deeper, beyond physical fitness, beyond training, beyond technique. And it's letting her not only survive, but do the impossible and start blasting back against the challenger. And slowly, once again, the entire landscape of the fight transforms. Jacek now on the brink of oblivion. Now it's the challenger who's forced to dig for something deeper. And maybe it's her raw tenacity. Maybe it's her love of fighting or her knowledge that this could be her very last shot at the championship. But whatever it is, she finds it. And it lets her stand once again in this impossible battle with the champion. And over and over the two clash, surviving the impossible. And I cannot overstate it. It is like they become more than human. They have pushed each other past any conceivable limit. 
and it is incredible. And my favorite part of the entire encounter comes at the start of the fifth and final round, when the two exit their corners and instead of throwing out punches, kicks, or grapples, or anything that could have ended the fight, they just for a second hug. In this brutal combat scenario, they show each other this brief moment of respect and love, and it's awesome. I'm not going to talk about who won this fight, because honestly, it doesn't matter. This was a moment when two people brought out the very best in each other and transcended, become something more, and that is absolute best that is what fighting can be. And the reason I love Tepu is it understands that. It knows fighting. It knows it's not about size or gender. It's not about getting hurt or hurting another person. It's about taking everything you are and rising past it. And if you're someone who's ever wanted to try fighting, hope this video is going to be the push you need to do so. But also to seek out this insanely underrated manga about girls who like punching each other. Friends, hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did and would like to help me make more like it, you can do so over at patreon.com forward slash super eyepatchwolf, where for a single dollar you can have your name listed with these beautiful folk right here. Special thank you this week to Ben Bowman, Jessica Murray, Tessa Grissom, I'm gonna say Zen Gaijin, It's Crispy Chips, Jenny Vu, and Super Chunk. Find me as ever hosting the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast on twitch.tv forward slash super eyepatchwolf or on Twitter at eyepatchwolf. Friends, take care of yourselves and I'll see you next time.